Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Susan Barber and I'm the Community Education Manager at Mission Hospice and Home Care. And for those that are not familiar with us, we are a small not-for-profit and non-affiliated, meaning that we are not part of a large healthcare or hospital system. We're a smallish hospice located in San Mateo County, which is the county just below San Francisco. And we serve patients in San Mateo County, as well as Northern Santa Clara County, which gives us a fairly diverse uh, group of people that we serve from Silicon Valley tech folks to migrant farm workers out on the coast and everybody in between. And we've been part of the San Mateo community. We were founded by two women. The first uh, one of the women became our first patient and died in 1979. And we've been serving patients ever since. Our second founder died in 2014, at the age of 103 and watched thousands of family members and patients being served by Mission Hospice during her time. So we welcome you all here tonight. I know there's people here from um, our service area, definitely. There's people here from California, uh, folks from Europe and the East Coast. So to all of you, particularly those of you on the East Coast and in Europe that are up in the middle of the night, thank you so much for coming. Um, I wanna just say a couple of words about tonight's talk. I'm so pleased to have Dale Larson with us. I first met Dale, I think, gosh, maybe in the, to early 2000s, mid 2000s, and it was at the Compassion in Action Conference that Dale was um, one of the primary sponsors for at the Santa Clara University where it was held and where he is a professor of psychology. Um, Dale is a professor of counseling psychology at Santa Clara University, where he directs the graduate studies in health psychology. A, clinical, a clinician and a researcher, Dr. Larson is a Fulbright scholar a fellow in three divisions of the American Psychological Association and a member of the International Work Group on Death, Dying and Bereavement. He's a leader in the end of, care, end of life care and training. He's co-directed the pioneering Berkeley Hospice Training Project and was a senior editor and a contributing author for Finding Our Way, Living with Dying in America. It was a national newspaper series that reached 7 million Americans. And I remember too when that came out, Dale. His publications on end of life issues, professional stress are widely, and, oh, and self-concealment, grief counseling, and secrets and self-concealment were widely cited, both in the scientific literature and popular media. Dr. Larson has keynoted conferences throughout North America, as well as Europe and Australia. For his contributions, he has received the Death Educator Award from the Association for Death Education, or ADEC, and was honored as an innovator of hospice and palliative care by the National Hospice Foundation. And tonight, Dale's gonna to be talking about his book, The Helper's Journey, which was, congratulations. Um, it was the awarded as book of the year from the American Journal of Nursing. And um, this is the second edition. So we are grateful tonight to have him. And a couple of notes, um, Betty Farrell, who those of you are familiar with her, she is a well-known PhD uh, nurse um, extraordinaire and um, is the prof a professor and director of nursing research at the City of Hope down in Southern California, which is a really formidable hospital level with their amazing training and research and education programs. And she writes that Dale Larson has been a consistent force for decades, shedding light on the essential issues in healthcare of compassion, empathy, and resilience. This new edition of The Helper's Journey is a deeper dive into these concepts that have become even more critical as we struggle to sustain a workforce to provide care in serious illness. This book is essential reading for any clinic, clinician providing compassionate care. And Mary Vachon, who is a registered psychotherapist and an adjunct professor in the Department of Psychiatry uh, at the uh, University of Toronto says, Dale Larson writes clearly about loss, empathy, compassion, and personal distress, burnout, compassion, fatigue, moral distress, and how to keep going when the going gets tough. Drawing on the latest research and his personal wisdom, he shows us how caring is good for us, but only if we practice self-compassion and are not drawing from empty wells. The Helper's Journey is a masterpiece for our time and the coming decades in the field. And I can't imagine a time more necessary for this kind of a conversation after the um, hellish year that most healthcare providers have had with COVID. And I'm just so very grateful uh, to have Dale Larson with us this evening. And thank you so much, Dale. It's yours now. Thank you so much, Susan. I, I really uh, am just so honored and, um, and just um, really, so grateful to, for you all to be here with me this evening. Um, I see some friends here. 
Um, I see Matt and Jean and Ed who are visible to me and uh, lots of other people I know who I've crossed paths with. And, you know, we have such a community here, one of the, and we have people from all over the world joining in as well. But I wanted to say something about, before I talk about the helper's journey, I want to say something about the hospice journey that I've been honored to kind of participate in and, and that's led to this book, ultimately, um, which is we have a long history here in the Bay Area. And I want to give kudos to uh, Mission Hospice, one of the really uh, pioneering hospice programs in the United States. You know, back in the day, it was 1979 that you uh, launched, and that those were exciting times. Those were those were really great times. You know, Connecticut Hospice got going in '74. Um, we had Shanti Project in Berkeley. Charlie Garfield went, uh, had that going. I was on the board there, and uh, we had Cars starting up in 1978. We had Hospice of the Valley. We had Hospice of Marin. You know, people think of us as Silicon Valley only, but we we've, we've been pretty significant in terms of end of life care. So uh, congratulations for all your great work. And it's an honor to be part of this, this series with such distinguished speakers. Um, back in that time, I was uh, in 75, 76, I was working at the VA as a, uh, doing my internship and I was working with dying patients. And then in 79, when Mission was just starting, uh, we, Charlie Garfield and I got an NIMH grant to do a national training program for hospice workers. So that was really what kind of launched me into this area. Maybe it started when I was five and my brother died. You know, I could argue that, that that was what really launched me into this area. But, you know, it was in the air. It was a really exciting time. Volunteerism was huge. And we were all excited. And Elizabeth's book had just been published in 69. So we, we were really going to town. And I know a lot of people in the uh, room with us tonight shared in that experience. Um, so I won't just <laughs> reflect on the past like old people tend to do. <laughs> I want to bring us up to the present. And the present, as Susan remarked, um, couldn't be more um, of a time to talk about the challenge of caring. In fact, I was thinking with this book, um, I wasn't writing it knowing that the pandem pandemic was coming, obviously. but um, Empathy, compassion, and the challenge of caring in a challenging time could be a new title for the book. We saw the headlines today of all the nurses leaving the field. This is in the, the, the newspaper. Uh, health professionals stressed. We're doing teletherapy, telemedicine. We have the novel coronavirus really creating, leading to a novel form of traumatic bereavement that we're going to be negotiating for a long time. It is really a, a difficult time, and it is a time when that challenge of caring, as I talk about it, is really put to the test. You know, I, I define the challenge of caring as finding a way to take your empathy and compassion, for us to take our empathy and compassion and maintain them, cultivate those, and put them to work without burning out as we help people to live with hope in a world in which loss and often trauma are inescapable. So I've kind of boiled everything's down, everything down to that in terms of our end of life care. Um, and um, you know, my experiences over those years after we did the, the mental health skills training program and I was going out to all the different hospice programs and my first publication in end of life area was 1982, we surveyed the 124 existing hospice programs. That now we have over 5,000. So a lot has happened in this time. Um, but while I was out there um, working with all these different programs, meeting all these exciting people, exciting ideas, I, I said, you know, there's a lot here that we can bring, uh, take, bring it from psychology, that, that there's so many ideas in psychology that, that people in hospice and palliative care and oncology haven't had time to even review. So I found myself in the role of trying to bring the ideas from psychology and, and, and to be really, although I do clinical work with seriously ill people and bereaved people, you know, I'd see myself as sort of a cheerleader trying to orchestrate things to get information to people and, and to help them to support people doing the frontline work. Um, and, you know, I think there's a courageous kind of quality to the work that I'm going to speak to you all as helpers. 
you know, and if you're saying, well, I'm not a professional helper, I'm not even a volunteer working with hospice, um, we're, we're all going to be caregivers in our lifetime, or we are already. And so all these ideas really apply. And that's what people have always uh, told me when they read the first edition and now responding to the, the second edition. And I do think it's heroic. And I, I, I don't want to you know, make you feel like I'm just giving you this empty stroke, because I, I think, you know, the way Joseph Campbell talks about uh, a hero is somebody who gives their life to something larger than themselves. Um, the, and the hero's journey, what's that like? Well, it always begins with a trauma. And you know, as my journey perhaps started, and there's, then there's adventure, and then there's victory in a crisis, and the hero returns as this changed and transformed person. And that's the kind of thing I've seen over all these years working with so many thousands of people. Um, and that's what this book is based on, real life experience combined with science and trying to have science inform what we're doing. So I really believe our work, your work is transforming. And I also think of us all and you all as pioneers. And I think as we look back you know, uh, at us uh, in the future, several hundred years, people are gonna go, oh my gosh, hospice was just starting then or psycho-oncology was just starting. And, and all the things that we're doing are really at the beginning of, of all this. So what I saw after the first edition of the book in the intervening time was that our field had just made so much progress. Positive psychology has added so much in our understanding of compassion and uh, empathy and neuroscience has contributed to understanding of how the brain works, the altruistic brain, you know, huge advances, understanding of, of our, what's going on at the, the cellular level in all of these things that we're, we're focused on. The evolution on research uh, of research on empathy, compassion, altruism, stress and coping, resilience, team functioning, caring systems, all the things that I write about in the book have been really phenomenal. And that's what I've tried to pull together in this book to really provide kind of a handbook for people on their helping journey that would, would touch on all these different topics and bring, bring in the latest research. Um, and I, that, it was an exciting I, a thing to do. Um, and, you know, let's start at the beginning though, because for all of us, um, there is a starting point. There's that point in time when you say, well, I'd like to do that kind of thing. I'd like to, you know, be involved in helping people. And we do it in various ways. It's not just working in the end of life field. I think everyone who's, who's participating in this room right now has had a mission in life that we're, we're making meaning doing what we're doing. And, and I, I started the book with that, really the inner world of helping. So what is it that, that brings us in? What is it that, that makes this uh, a meaningful thing for us to do? And, and why is it so important to us? What is the nature of altruism? So I started looking at that. And, and you know, as I was always with people doing the work, I would often say, well, what is it that, that makes it so rewarding for you? Um, and I won't get into all the research right now with the hundreds of references in the book on all this, but I want to share some of the more personal kinds of moments um, that I think uh, may, might touch us all and help us think about it. And I want to keep coming back to COVID reality that we're dealing with. And so as I go along, keep thinking about, well, how does this connect with what we're going through right now? And if I sometimes I might not make that point, but it's clearly there almost in everything I'm talking about how COVID has challenged us in all these different ways and, and made our work either you know, more difficult or more profoundly meaningful and difficult at the same time. Um, so you know, I, one of the experiences I had was uh, working in, you know, with different programs was leading different retreats. And um, the, um, what I called mission moments were the times when um, we'd stop and say, what are our best moments? What are our most rewarding experiences? That, that, that when we have them, we realize this is what, why I'm doing this. This is, this is what makes this meaningful. Um, for example, and I'm gonna re read a few examples from the book. A young mother with two young children, someone shared from a hospice program was dying. The family wouldn't allow her to hold her children because they thought this was a terrible thing and would scare the kids. 
So when they weren't around, I asked the kids if they wanted to get in bed with her and they said, yes. So I put them in her bed and she held them. And I have many examples of this in the book. And I write, you know, during these poignant encounters, these helpers said they felt peaceful. They had a sense of connectedness and believed they had made a difference. Their purpose in the work was being fulfilled. Through sharing their most meaningful experiences, the group members had answered the implicit question, but why do I do this difficult work? Now in that clearer lens, the struggles disclosed in our earlier conversations, we were talking about the stress of the work took on a different meaning. I keep thinking of being on campus at Santa Clara. I always remember Jim Bizarre, who was a, a Jesuit priest who I got to spend a lot of time with when he was dying. That was a time when the, the priests would come to Santa Clara and be in Nobley Hall and they were cared for there. Um, Jim was an amazing man and he had gone to a lecture I gave in Carmel on hospice care and he wanted to volunteer in hospice. He might've ended up at Mission Hospice with you, but he was seriously ill. So he couldn't go out and do it. And that was his greatest pain. He said that he couldn't continue to help people. Um, and I wrote about him, a whole lifetime of caring can be affirmed in just a few words. On his deathbed, James Bizarre, a Jesuit priest and dedicated helper, described one such instance to me. He had fought for the welfare of migrant farm workers for more than 25 years. Several years earlier, Jim was thrilled to learn that he and John Steinbeck were attending the same social gathering in New York. Jim was like this six foot five guy who was very shy, interesting, um, but very dynamic at the same time. At the party, he shyly approached Steinbeck and disclosed how the grapes of wrath had inspired his lifetime of caring work. Steinbeck overwhelmed Bizarre with his response. Then it was worth writing, Jim. And went on to say he had followed and respected Bizarre's work for many years. This simple yet profound exchange validated the caring contributions of both men. So in that chapter, I write about you know, volunteering and, and what we see if, and later on, I'm gonna talk about the, the trends that we see in the United States in terms of other focused or more altruistic kinds of traits and variables and the other side, which is the you know, self-focused kind of individualistic, non-collectivistic kind of side of things. And I'll, I'll, I'll share something on that as I kind of get out to the the, the, what, what is compassion at more of the national level? Um, I write at the end of this chapter about altruism and, and you know, as the, this pilot flame of caring that's burning in all of us and the altruistic brain and how we're wired to help others who are in distress. I write, it makes perfect sense that for us to survive as a species, acts of helping are rewarded both psychologically and immunologically. What if each act of caring and helping depleted the helper? decreased his or her immunity and mood and lessened the chances of survival. The view of caring and helping as being natural and good for us is intuitively and scientifically more accurate. When we help another person, we take part in an exchange, one that is shaped and finely tuned over eons to ensure that when we help others, we also help ourselves. Now, you might be thinking, geez, that's kind of a rosy picture because we know how difficult uh, helping really is. And that's what I look at in the next section of the book, when I look at um, emotional involvement and helping, how can we be emotionally involved? How we, can we be empathic without falling into what I call the helper's pit? How can we remain compassionately connected with our patients and families and all the people we're helping without burning out? Now, you know, when we look at this literature, we know that burnout, and we know today with the COVID situation, burnout is going through the roof right now. I don't know what's happening at uh, Mission, how you're negotiating it, but being in touch with hospices and uh, from Trinidad to the East Coast, I've been doing different webinars and talking to staff. It's really tough and we've all seen it on TV. We've seen uh, if, if we're not in the on the front lines ourselves, we see that the absolutely impossible situations people are in. Those are extreme situations. Those are wartime kinds of situations that health professionals are are struggling with. So how to how to deal with that? How to take care of oneself? You know, is just absolutely becoming vital 
to the survival of, of these healthcare workers caring for COVID patients and in this new reality. But <clears throat> what I, I, you know, really look at to try to understand, well, what is burnout? You know, the demoralized kind of experience, the diminished caring and the, the, the kind of exhaustion that characterized burnout, but also we have moral distress and that's a big thing in, in COVID care because you know, when you're when you're triaging ventilators, that's a really tough ethical situation. And and when you have staffing issues and you don't have PPE, this raises all kinds of issues for leadership and for staff. Um, tremendous issues that come up that create moral distress. This I should be doing something else, but I can't do it. I can't provide the kind of care I, I know I should be providing. And then we have traumatic kind of vicarious trauma that's happening for everyone because you're around people who are so traumatized. You're holding the face, the phone for a FaceTime goodbye, end of life conversation. We can all imagine what that must be like for the nurse or the doctor or the social worker who's there or the clergy member who's there holding that phone and knowing the agony of the family member who can't come in to be with their loved one. This is stress that's unbelievable. So, you know, we have to find a way in everyday circumstances, which are always challenging in end of life care, to find balance, to find emotional balance, to find a way to, to remain involved. And, you know, I write about the constructive zone and exquisite empathy and in different ways to talk about being emotionally involved without burning out. The way Carl Rogers talked about it was empathy was sensing the other person's feelings and experiences as if they were your own, but without ever losing that as if quality. So we have to find a way to be emotionally involved without burning out. And that's what I then take on in the next chapter in the book. And I'm kind of going through it by chapter because I think it's kind of makes sense and the, the, the sequence makes sense because we have to know how to, how to navigate the stress that's inevitable there in that work. Um, I had the background at Berkeley with Dick Lazarus who was a teacher and Matt, Chris Maslach was there and Ayala Pines. So I was steeped in the burnout and stress kind of um, thinking. And, and, and you know, what's really exciting is we, the bad news is there is a lot of burnout. There is a lot of moral distress. There is a lot of vicarious traumatization or compassion fatigue secondary traumatization, but we know what works. And what I've tried to bring together is what are the resilience enhancing things that can keep us balanced? And, you know, and what some of the things are, uh, things that we're all familiar with, you know, that with, this is from positive psychology and um, we have mindfulness as, and self-compassion. And we have you know, the appraisal process, working on how we're appraising things. Are we seeing a threat? Are we seeing a challenge? We know all of us, I think, recognize the value of social support and something we're really pretty good at in hospice in terms of providing support to each other. Um, but it gets a little more challenging, doesn't it, Susan, with um, doing it uh, in Zoom rooms? Um, and, and, you know, and one of the really intriguing findings and it's so central is that the, your purpose in the work, which is what brought us in, and which also makes us vulnerable. We know from research that the people who are high empathy, the most idealistic, most motivated people are sometimes the most likely to burn out because they come in and we've all seen them if we're in the field, you know, running in and trying to solve everything and everything's an emergency. And that doesn't work very well. So we have to, we have, but in one study by Stotland, Ezra Stotland, he found that the who scored the highest on this empathy test were actually uh, the, the first nurses to burn out because they went into the room and they were overwhelmed. They, were, they, they, they didn't know what to do with their empathy. They had high empathy. They had a deep, deep feeling for the, the, the patient's pain. But after they received supervision and training and support, they became the most effective nurses as judged by um, researchers and colleagues and patients and families. So we have to find a way to take that empathy and put it to work without burning out. That's the, the real challenge. And one of the really intriguing findings is that 
you know, your purpose in the work can be one of the best buffers against stress. There's a new term, eudaimonia, but it's not new at all. It's really a Greek term. Eudaimonia is a term for a kind of happiness that we have um, that transcends everyday kind of hedonic happiness. Now, I like hedonic happiness. I like a good meal and I like having fun as we all do. But this is a little deeper. This is when you're, you're really making meaning and you have sense that purpose in your life, which is what has always kept me involved in this field, because that's what is so beautiful, is seeing us able to you know, uh, do what um, we are really meant to do as human beings, but sometimes we don't have an opportunity. And I think that that's the powerful thing about being in, in, as a, a professional or a volunteer caregiver. Uh, whether you're a nurse, doctor, social worker, clergy, volunteer, what you're doing, Susan, leading programs, it has such deep meaning. You know? And we have tough days, but at the end of the day, we've done, we've done something meaningful. And you know, from sitting at a lot of deathbeds, I know that that's ultimately what you know, really matters. Um, so you know, I, I, then you know, my, my research area is actually, I research professional stress and, and burnout and all that. But you know, one of the areas that I've kind of innovated in is the study of secrets and self-concealment. And that is really significant in helping people at the end of life. In fact, doing this kind of work kind of ushers us into a world of secrets. And you know, we've all talked about the, 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 the horse on the table or the, you know, the elephant in the room. No one's talking about it in terms of communication with patients about diagnoses and prognoses. And, that, that journey from curative care to palliative care and how, what kinds of conversations you know, are necessary um, and to, to have that happen uh, for the patient and family. And then there, what I, I've looked at and studied and researched helper secrets, all the feelings that we have. I've led so many support groups and I started back then and I said, you know, it's like everybody's having the same kind of struggle and yet they don't want to talk about it because they think it's really not okay to have doubts about oneself, to have distanced oneself from patients, to feel like they're an imposter, to uh, you know, all these different experiences that, that become secrets and then they kind of corrode from within. So I studied that systematically and I've, re I've gathered thousands of helper secrets and written about it. And, and I have a lot on that in, in the book. And, that's always resonated with people. That was my, one of my most popular articles ever. Back in the 70s, I wrote my first little paper on that. And it was everywhere I went, I saw that paper. Because, you know, and now we have, just to link it up with COVID, we have COVID shaming happening. So we, and we're also a new study came out saying that people are concealing their behaviors related to COVID. And so they're, they're actively concealing what they've done or not done and then they're not also sharing their symptoms because they don't want, you know, this is like the AIDS epidemic. Again, we don't want to let people know that maybe somebody in our family had COVID. And though this creates huge problems in terms of contact tracing and all that, that kind of thing. So this is a phenomenon happening. So secrets play, you know, a role in, in so much of what we do. Um, and, you know, having, you mentioned Betty Farrell. She has a beautiful article I, I write about in my um, in the book about uh, confessions at the end of life that, that so many patients uh, make. And I've certainly been there with that, uh, with people at the end of life. Um, you know, some of the, the secrets that helper secrets that people share. Here's an example of one. Um, I'm a fraud. People don't think I'm an expert, but sometimes I don't know, and I should. Deep down inside, I feel that I'm fooling everyone. I'm not as bright or confident as people think I am. What if I fail? What should I do? I feel like I'm an imposter. At work, everyone looks up to me for the latest and how to do it best, you know, but it's not there, you know? And it, at least I don't see it as there. And, you know, I know in this room, I know I've seen some of your names and I know some of you well, um, we've all had these kind of feelings uh, doing the work, but what we need is we, we need to share them with, with confidants, other people who can respond and understand. And we have to not expect our spouse or our partner to understand all this. We need to 
create supportive communities and talk to other people doing the work and share these things and get beyond the fallacy uniqueness. So that's been a big, a big thrust in my work is let's let's talk about what this is really like. And that's, I think, what the, I hope the book achieves is um, bringing forth a lot of experiences that we don't easily talk about. And not just the difficult side, but also the joys of doing the work, which we also don't talk about. We don't want to be bragging about how wonderful we are. Um, so we, we don't talk about that either. And we need to find time to, you know, celebrate the work and to celebrate each other and also to share this is not easy. And you know, you can imagine the experiences that people are having doing uh, care for COVID patients. Just what I hear, um, you know, in webinars and, and some work with different teams is absolutely amazing. Um, so we also have to find a way to take that empathy and compassion and you know, put it to work, not just to avoid burnout and, 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 and you know, communicate that empathy, but it's, we have to find the words, we have to develop the relationships that really work. And this is another exciting area where we've done, had so much good work on the working alliance. Carl Rogers was a big influence on me personally. You know, I had got to spend time with him um, after I graduated from Berkeley. Um, and of course, Carl, you know, was the creator or founder of person-centered approach. Well, now in healthcare, I think we've all heard person-centered care, holistic care, whole person care, biopsychosocial plus spiritual care, patient-centered care. These are all the terms that are everywhere. But, you know, what's true for all of those, you know, is that let's talk about whole person care, which is one of the most frequently used terms. The issue is whole person care requires your whole person. So we have to be present. We have to be present to suffering. We have to be in those conversations that are so difficult to have. We have to listen to things that are not always easy to listen to. We have to be a team member and be vulnerable with other team members and, and, and take feedback and learn from each other and you know, not just be doing everything the way we want to do it. Uh, so there are so many challenges in this work and we you know, have to develop that relationship. And I think the person-centered model is really perfect for um, you know, so much of the work we do and for grief counseling. And I make that argument in the, the book. And um, you know, of course, the other thing is that in the, you know, one of the things that's happened is those who are in the grief, grief counseling and you know, bereavement area in general, like probably most of us, there have been so many developments in the field where we're looking at continuing bonds and we've got different models, the sheer complicated, Kathy's uh, Shear's complicated grief model, which I know, Susan, you've had Kathy present here. Um, you know, Bill Warden's task model, which has been around for a long time, but he's always tweaking it. And we have, um, all the exciting work in so many different areas in grief counseling and Sandler's work and on and on. So I write about some of that and try to pull that together in the book as well. And that's, that's just all exciting to me. It's like the evolution of the field. And you know, I think it's very important that we know about this you know, if we're doing, doing this work. Um, so you know, healing words, the art and science of helping and healing communication is really a, a, a big focus of mine because I'm, I teach in a counseling program with these wonderful students who are becoming therapists. And I keep hoping that they'll, some of them will come to you, Susan, and, and be at a mission and, and get involved in bereavement care. And, and you know, it's, uh, it's scary stuff sometimes, but, but so many of them are really, you know, drawn to it. Um, and, you know, that's something I'm very exciting, excited about, you know, is, is um, how that, that can happen. Um, you know, on the, back on the uh, uh, secrets aspect, at the, the conclusion of that chapter is a passage I wanted to read. I, I like, it's often forgotten because this is my, my model for most of what I do. And, and let's see if it fits through your, in your experience. It's often forgotten in the Greek myth of Pandora's box, after the Furies escape, one enti entity remains, hope. Perhaps the key to our success was that we kept the lid open long enough. I was talking about a, a, a an event I, I volunteered at a something called the Weekend Weekend that we had kind of turned in, done a California version of it where we took 
recently diagnosed cancer patients and their families away. We had a grant and we all volunteered and we took them away to a retreat. It was really a powerful experience. They all shared their hopes and fears. Really amazing, you know, moment for everybody involved. Um, so after this experience, you know, um, everyone came together and all the things that we were afraid to talk about were openly talked about. I say perhaps the key to our success is we kept the lid open long enough for hope to emerge. We might have closed the lid too soon or never opened it or tried to beckon hope without our terrifying companions. The lesson here, one which applies to our secrets and those of our patients and families, and which is a major focus in the remaining chapters of this book, is that hope can emerge triumphant, replacing denial, avoidance, and fear when it's sustained by empathy, caring, and support. So that's sort of my model for psychotherapy, for family interventions, for what we're doing in end of life care. We have to you know, be responsive to the distress, to the pain, to the suffering, turn on our pain compasses, be tuned in. But then when that is really experienced, when that experience is allowed to be experienced and accepted, which is the foundation of all the, the the, the, the recent therapies, acceptance and commitment therapy, dialectical behavior therapy, and, and all the different therapies that are kind of uh, holding sway now. Um, then hope can emerge triumphant and have her day and replace avoidance, fear, and denial. So it's sort of my model for much of what we're doing in our work. Um, and I find that I find that kind of helpful. And when I talk about how can we maintain our compassion and empathy. Um, and, you know, in a world, in, you know, and in, in help people in a world where trauma and, and uh, uh, grief are unavoidable, how can we help people maintain hope? I think that's what we need to do. We need to be present to them to allow them to share their, their pain. Carl once said, he said, um, we have to be with people in the place where they feel most alone. And I think that that's a, a very good guiding uh, kind of uh, idea for us, you know, doing this powerful work. Um, you know, I, I um, realized that, you know, early on that, okay, because I was working in medical context, geez, we have to be part of a team. Now that's challenging for us because most of us are very independent people. Uh, I know, you guys, I don't have to even know who's all in this room, but I know that most of us are pretty independent, slightly, you wouldn't want to call yourself maybe a maverick, but you know, you're a little bit independent. That's how you ended up doing this stuff <laughs> in this field. And, and okay, that's great. But what does being on a team require? It requires functioning interdependently. Um, it, it requires, getting beyond the I'm perfect syndrome, like everything I do is perfect. Yeah, maybe absolutely perfect and really great, but it's not working in terms of the team. So there's been a lot of really good work looking at what makes teams uh, function well and, and what, what kinds of exchanges, you know, make for a, 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 more, a higher, a better functioning team is the number of positive responses to the number of, you know, constructive, not negative, but on the other side, kind of saying, well, maybe you could do this differently. We have to be willing to change our own behavior. And so I looked at all, all different models for, um, you know, what makes the team really work? What kind of support systems really make a difference? You know, we have, some of us might have in our medical context, Schwartz rounds where we go and talk. By the way, that what's so important about like Schwartz rounds where we stop and talk about the meaning of this case and, or this care of this, this person to us and what it, how it really touches us and, and we process those things. That's because the purpose of the work is right there in our experience and we're talking about it. And that's why it's sustaining and that's why it's, it's so eudaimonic, if you will. Um, so a lot of what we have in, you know, in IDT, those of you who are in hospice, and you know, we've got to find ways to make that be as supportive as possible. It's another way we're really challenged. Trying to do this in a Zoom room is a little bit different you know, from being in the, in the same room. We can do it, but it's a little bit more difficult. And so I love thinking about teams, how to work with conflict in teams. I've led so many retreats 
for teams, and I did something at Stanford with the, the incredible bone marrow transplant team a couple of years ago. And earlier in my career, I was doing a lot with Hospice of the Western Reserve and uh, in Florida, Sun Coast, and all these different programs. So I learned a lot about teams just from being there and and seeing the dynamics and then trying to to think about how we can make them work more effectively. So what you really have to have is you have to have your mission division process. Let's go back to the mission, mission moments, which is all those great moments I was sharing earlier. Your mission to vision, vision process should be in alignment with the team's mission division process. And ideally that would be in alignment with the organization's mission division process. So if I'm at mission hospice, which is a great name for the program, by the way. Uh, I want to have my mission division process be aligned with the team. So I feel like the team is supporting me and my mission division process. And overall, we're all aligned with the organizations. And I think that's something I, I see at, at Mission and I see in you know, the great programs. Um, so then, you know, I'm thinking about, okay, well, we've got, you know, the individual um, helper's journey, and we're trying to make a difference with patients and families and with teammates, team members. Uh, what about the larger society? You know, how does some of this thinking and, and the research uh, apply in that situation? Um, you know, I, I, the last chapter in the book, I begin with a, a quote from uh, Paul Ehrlich and Robert Ornstein, and it's kind of prescient in a way and you'll see why in a moment. They write, all of us, citizens of every nation, are now in the same family, are now in the same boat, walking the same tightrope, like it or not. The worst problems of the human predicament are common to all of us, from climate disruption, loss of biodiversity, and poisoning of the environment to pandemics, gross economic inequities, and the threat of nuclear war. Our tightrope is a line from humanity's past to its future. So, you know, we are walking on a tightrope and I don't think, I think all of us are probably more aware of that now than we've ever been in terms of the different crises and the kinds of grief we're having, environmental grief, political grief, um, and economic grief. Um, it, and and the challenges have become greater. One of the kind of discouraging things is obviously some of the political failures we've had, um, but our collective caregiver is really strained in other ways. When we look at the research, we find that, I mentioned this earlier, that other focused or compassion related kinds of traits, attitudes, values, and behaviors like empathy, um, secure attachment, moral reasoning, concern for others, um, trends away from collectivist kinds of values. Those are um, decreasing in our society. Huge surveys on this. They have regular surveys on all these different uh, dimensions. Although volunteering has increased, interesting, there's the only counterpoint to that uh, along the way. And, you know, a couple of things that I have in the book, which is about a little bit on volunteering, but also on caregiving. The new research is actually showing that caregiving is not as bad as we've made it out to be. So that's kind of encouraging. Um, and, yeah, of course, if your parent has, is, has Alzheimer's and is wandering, that is about as stressful as it can get. But in general, people find caregiving tremendously rewarding. Of course, there are financial strains and all that. But Looking at it very carefully, we, we don't need to, to have the stereotype that caregiving is such a, a terrifically stressful thing. It can be, but not in every case. And in fact, in general, people find it tremendously rewarding. Of course, this is no argument for, I think we need more support for caregivers. We need more policies and everything else, but there's a, it, it just shines a different light on that. Um, so even though, you know, Volunteering has increased increases in individualism, narcissism, extreme extrinsic motivations and goals, and individualistic kinds of goals are those are increasing. 
So we've got a challenge ahead of us. We have a challenge in terms of our educational system. We have a challenge in terms of um, our, um, uh, you know, how we're raising our children. Are we really helping them with emotional intelligence? Are we, uh, you know, together, are we really working to build in more compassion? You know, this is the plea that actually I start chapter five with this, you know, all of the, the really well-written um, papers and, and statements about the need for more compassionate care. You know, the argument that our healthcare system is in really you know, real trouble. And that sometimes it's not too much about health. It's not very much about care and it's not very much of a system, although it has its good moments. Um, I think hospice has kind of led the way in so many ways in terms of um, being a model. Um, but, um, you know, healthcare is, is struggling. So we have to, we have to um, really work on that and see what we can do to make it uh, be more um, compassionate. And that's one of the reasons I, I worked on this book. You know, I've, I've thought, what, what's the impact of COVID? You know, we are with the World Health and Palliative Care Alliance and then with um, uh, Hospice Foundation of America, we just sent a letter, they sent a letter to, I was signing it and involved, to the White House trying to create a office of bereavement. And I'm hoping that that happens. And I think if anybody could respond positively to this, it would be Joe Biden. I think he was a great grief counselor uh, the other day when he gave his talk. It was right out of my class. And if anybody, I hope some students from my class are here, I, I was gonna comment to them that here he was saying exactly what we were saying needs to happen in, in grief counseling. You know, he was really doing it and talking to the nation. So I was very encouraged by that. And I thought, you know, maybe the, the COVID will, pandemic will, and I, I felt that at the beginning, and of course these things do tend to, to fade, but there was a way that we were all aware of our fragility, of, of the, 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 the fragility of life. And together, if it hadn't gotten politicized in this crazy way, you know, we might have been able even more than we have to kind of pull together and realize we are all together in this. This is, this is, you know, we have this life together. Um, I, I wrote it in the book at, near the end. When we're able to confront and accept loss and the impermanence of life, our natural empathy can transform into a deep sense of compassion, binding us in a helping and healing way with the suffering of others. This transformation could serve as a compass to guide our helping journeys and awaken the spirit of caring that resides deep within us. I really think that, you know, that a sense of loss underlies and motivates our compassion. I could talk about this more scientifically, if you will, and look at the research, which I do in the book, you know, looking at empathy versus compassion. Empathy leads to compassion, but empathy doesn't always lead to helping behavior. This is one of the the real findings. Sometimes we have to, um, you know, rise above a lot of things in order to act in a in a positive pro-social way. Um, there is a phenomenon now studied as compassion collapse, which is really a, a real phenomenon. With, and we can all relate to it. It's when we see a situation, there are just so many people. There's such a big problem. There's nothing I can do. I feel a moment of compassion and, and empathy, but there's nothing I can do, so I'm, I'm not going to do anything. So we're overwhelmed and less likely to help, for example, when large numbers of suffering persons are involved. How do we, how do we navigate that? Um, we don't believe our actions will make a difference. This is all you know, based on research that looks at these kinds of phenomena. Um, so you know, compassion doesn't necessarily lead to helping behaviors. Um, so compassion and desire to help aren't exactly the same. Yet compassion, you know, empathy could lead to altruism and helping behavior, but we need to adapt our this ancient emotion to its global, new global current context. And I think that has to involve our moral judgments uh, combining with our compassion to guide our, our helping journey. I like the image of the compass that I have on the 
cover of the books there with the heart in it because <laughs> that's my favorite image that I think you know if you if you think about compassion it has the word compass in it and it has the word passion in it so I like to think that compassion is the compass that can guide us using our passion to help others you know and it's all in that one word and I, I think that that this is the project that we have the ultimate challenge of caring how can we have this sense of 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 weeness with the larger world with the larger group of people we're all part of as human beings um i write throughout the book about as bonds of weeness and barriers of weeness how can we have those bonds of weeness that really predict whether we will help or not you know the Oliners studied the rescuers of the, the jews and in europe and found that you know sometimes these people said i don't even like jewish people but i still am willing to risk my entire family and my life to hide them away. So they still had these biases and these prejudices, but they realized this is the right thing to do. Right? And so we all have to overcome differences. We have to overcome our political differences, our um, you know social differences, all the ethnicity, just on and on. You know, um, and certainly we've learned that in hospice. We've learned how what it really means to open your heart to the anonymous stranger and uh, the challenge of that. And we're not asking, well, what religion are you? What, how did you vote in the last election, et cetera? You know, we are, we are, we, our humanity brings us together. So, you know, I, I, I've thought a lot about, um, you know, this in terms of, and I, this may, this may, a lot of people won't know what I'm talking about, but the, the movie, The Day the Earth Stood Still, which was one of my favorites growing up. Whenever that would come on, I would just my, I would just run in and watch it, and I just loved it. Well, I still love it. You know, it's the Michael Rennie and Sam Jaffe um, movie. That these are the two key figures, and in it, this alien comes with this robot, and they're gonna make the Earth stop acting up, and and all this violence. You, we don't need to bring it to our, our universe out there, uh, to our planets or whatever, and they try to wake up you know, uh, the, the, the people on, the, all of us on planet Earth to stop this violence. And um, I, I was hoping that COVID would do that. You know, COVID would be the, the stimulus that would say, look, and you know, I think environmental crisis is gonna have some of that effect when we start seeing that, oh wait, we're all here together. We can't just be individualistically kind of focused. So, you know, anyhow, I, I don't mean to, you know, wax so uh, dramatic on, on this. I'm not a great um, thinker on any of on that, but I, I tried to bring all the themes in the book together in this last chapter, trying to make a statement. And it's remarkably how much it really applied. And there was even the word pandemic <laughs> in this in this quote. So, you know, my my thought is, you know, that the helper's journey is is a really um, a really honorable one, you know, we can live according to cherished values. We can have this kind of eudaimonic kind of happiness. And, but it's, it's, it's difficult work as we all know. And it takes, it takes, uh, it asks a lot of us, um, but that is how we grow. And, and that's what I've tried to capture in the, the book and, and marshal all the scientific data supporting what I kind of have experienced myself and I've seen it all the wonderful people and all of you um, doing this terrific work. And uh, so I'm, I'm just always kind of in awe. By, by the way, one of the things we, we found is that the experience of awe promotes pro-social behavior, which I think is pretty neat. They did a study at Berkeley where they had one group look up at these beautiful trees and the other group look at these boring engineering buildings and then ask them if they wanted to help someone. And the people who were looking at the trees were more likely to help because they they said I was in awe and you know so I think we have to keep our sense of awe and in all these situations um, you know and I'd like to in our when we're now doing Q and A um, to maybe maybe we'll get more directly connected to our current realities I, if I veered too far away from those please forgive me but I, I wanted to share what the, the basic themes of the book were so. 
thanks a lot for listening and and uh, I'm really looking forward to if anybody's still here to uh, hear and see what's uh, what's on your mind and heart. Well, thank you so very much. I'm going to allow people to be able to unmute themselves. And um, boy, so much of your talk, when you were talking about um, sort of the beginnings of things, I was just going through a little um, life review of my time in, in San Francisco during the AIDS epidemic and just the uh, sort of the polarization, which is what the beginning of this uh, COVID experience reminded me of where people didn't want to talk about it. People didn't want to say they had COVID. They didn't want to say their family member had COVID. Um, and just kind of the response from our government felt so similar to the experience I had in the 80s in the 90s in San Francisco. And that was a time I see some other people nodding. That for me completely changed my life. I Somebody had said to me, even a year before, you're going to end up spending the rest of your life working in end of life care. I would have thought they were insane. Um, but that experience for many of us, I think, here in this uh, space tonight, it was really, it, it just was life changing. Um, and so when you were, you were, there was a couple of things. We have a couple of questions, and thank you. And pe if people would like to raise their hand to ask a question, that would be fantastic. And yes, Pat Frasca, who sent me a private chat saying, we knew each other then. We had completely different lives. She was working at pg and &E and I was working in the stock market. I think we were playing softball together. And now she's a child, care, a child development specialist and worked at the George Mark Center for children who were dying and <laughs> working in end of life care. So it's been a long journey for both of us. Mm -hmm. But I'm, um, we have a couple of questions. And for people that would like to just ask Dale themselves, which he would prefer that to me just reading them and asking them to you, to him, um, to raise your hand for those of you that don't live in Zoom like some of us do, you can go to the bottom or top of your screen and click, for some of you on older version of Zoom, click on just participants and there's a little hand waver. And then, or for most of people that are on the newer version of Zoom under reactions, uh, it will say raise hand. It's not the thumbs up or the other folks there. So if anybody wants to do that, please do go ahead and raise your hand. And um, you know, a couple, there are some questions that I'm going to ask you. And Dale, I'm curious between the first edition and second edition of this book. Yeah. I, I see you giving some um, hand signals. Well, yeah, I see Leah, but what was your, what was your oh, point? Oh, uh, go ahead. I'll, I'll ask after you, Susan. Mine is in there. I was just going to verbalize it. Okay. Beautiful. Because yes, and I'm going to un um, I'm going to un um, pin myself so that you'll be able to jump in here during that time. But I was curious in terms of the first and second edition of the book, what were your biggest surprises, or were there any discoveries between those two editions? Um, oh, yeah, that's well, that's why I wrote it because it was so much. Yeah. Well, the, the the positive thing was that uh, everything really built on what I had thought about and written about earlier and it just made it more differentiated and, and con confirmed it so you know I'd always had the view of, of a certain view of human nature I'd always had a certain understanding of how teams work I had always had a I had a pretty good handle on uh, burnout um, but I didn't know all the research that would come in the next 20 years I'm kind of the cicada of second edition so you know, the first book came when I felt like I have to share this. This is just fun to put this all together. And the same thing happened with the second edition. I told my publisher when I'm, you know, 95, I'll do a third edition. Um, but um, the, uh, but yeah, no, it's just seeing all, you know, if you look at the, you do look at the book and you see what's in there, there's a lot of a new work in there. It's really 70% new. The book 80% new. So the other things I kept in were a lot of the, the vignettes that are kind of timeless. Some of the vignettes, you know, which are really timeless. They could be in 100 years from now. But um, yeah, so it's just exciting. They're exciting fields. I mean, grief and if you're looking at positive psychology and neuroscience and, uh, you know, work on altruism and oh gosh, and, and helping and the psychotherapy and um it's just phenomenal um mm. so yeah so leah what was your uh not you know and there are people i can't see so i don't mean to be i think well, you're gonna oh you thank you leah, thank yeah. you dr larson your talk was terrific i've never met you or heard of you and i'm thrilled 
uh, to meet you, having been born and raised in Berkeley, California, literally born 1960, so I was a kid seeing Abby Hoffman, the SLA were stolen, or rather Patty Hearst was stolen a block away from me. I would think that the trends would be that people have more compassion in terms of all the evolution that at least I saw in Berkeley, even though it was a hotbed and there was turmoil. So how do you explain and you said that there's a lot of research and many polls that show that the trends are people are getting more narcissistic, more selfish and self-centered. How on earth do you explain that? Thank you very much. Well, it's not happening for everybody in this room is my hunch. But when you look at large scale surveys, tens of thousands of people, and you look at these trends and, and they study these specific traits and how much are you concerned about others? That kind of item. And it, it, yeah, I have a kind of like you, a Berkeley bias, you know, that things are moving in a positive direction. We're growing and evolving. And of course, this is going to go toward the Omega point and the, you know, tail hard day Chardin kind of thing or something. I don't know. Um, get Ed Holland to chime in on that. But the, uh, he's a minister, but, but the, but the, um, uh, yeah, it is a little disconcerting, but look at what look at what we've had happen. I don't want to get into politics, but look what we've had happen, how easily people are lured into a, a lot of divisiveness. Um, and, uh, you know, the, 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 the hegemony of individualistic kinds of um, self interest uh, has happened. And, you know, uh, greed and that's really got a good hold on our in our culture, and that's what's reflected in these surveys. Um, but there is a force, and you know that's why I think um, we have our work to do. But I think you know everyone in this room is contributing to, you know, turning that around to, you know, increasing empathy and compassion, and we're doing that in our personal lives. And we've got to do it with our organizations, and I hope as a nation we begin to you know, reverse the, the recent trend away from that. I mean, um, I think Barack Obama was the first president I've, I've heard say empathy over and over again. Um, you know, that was kind of nice, but then, you know, kind of shifted. So Leah, I'm, I'm hoping that, I'm hoping that the forces, uh, you know, um, are not gonna continue, the trends don't continue in that direction. My hope is that some of these mega disasters and you know, universally experienced um, crises would bring us together, like, you know, Gort, Klaatu, Verada, Nikto, whatever, you know, kind of moment. But um, don't have, yeah, but thanks for the question. Yeah. Thank you, Leah. Thank you. Yes, I was curious about that also. Um, Randy Wren has her hand up, and I'm going to add her here. And then Jean, we're going to have Jean Wan has a question. Hi, Randy. Hi, thanks for the lecture. And um, I actually saw you, gosh, maybe five years ago at Mills Peninsula Hospital, Do uh, maybe even longer ago than that. Um, so I am a spiritual health counselor. And I've also um, have been trained in the ritual cleansing of the body and subsequent um, dressing for burial. Okay. And this work has allowed me to never look at another human being the same. And I feel as though there's so much more to us than our corporal bodies and that we have another component, um, you know, call it soul, spirit, or energy. And I was wondering, what, if anything, do you think is eternal? <laughs> wow, holy cow. You know, I wrestle with this more um, with my, my clients. I know this may sound strange, but bereaved parents and people who are struggling with the loss of someone, and I sit with them, and I just, there's this part of me that, that hopes, and I've heard so many things shared. Anyone who's here in the room who's worked in hospice, I'm, I'm, we could all share incredible stories that tell us, you know, there's more to this than, than, than we, uh, we see in our just mortal frames, you know. So I'm, I'm open. I just listen to 
you know, um, the universe. And um, I don't have, um, I don't have like a belief system around it. I just have an openness. And I'm, I sit with, I sit with people who are struggling to have that kind of contact, you know, that, that kind of presence that's transcendent with with their loved ones. When you lose a child, when you lose someone dear to you, and then you realize everybody in this room will all be somewhere uh, or, or nowhere, who knows what it will be, but it will be happening for all of us. Um, certainly, let's say 50 years, I don't know. Uh, I don't think anyone's gonna make it past another 50, are we? Anybody thinking they're gonna make it past another 50? Uh, there might be some, undergraduates here maybe I don't know but you know maybe 60 70 certainly 100 years unless technology anyhow you know what Randy I'm not answering because I'm stumbling maybe we need to cons I, but what I'm hearing is the profound the profound nature of the work you're doing for you and that's what really is beautiful and how you're really you're discovering something that means so much to you and that that really makes you feel connected to the universe in a different way and to spirit spiritual dimensions that I just think is wonderful. And um, the moments I've had that are very, very special for me. Thank you for that. Yeah, that's so cool. And then Jeannie had something. Jeannie, okay, Jeannie is, was with me at Hospice of the Valley. Matt Weinstein, he might have left already and he spoke at Compassion in Action, which Jeannie and I really kind of did together. She is a pioneer, a pioneering lady, I'll tell you. So it's so great to see you, Jeannie. But what were you gonna say, Jeannie? Oh, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dale. It's wonderful to see you. It's been ages. And uh, I, I look forward to asking you this question. Um, you, you mentioned in your talk um, briefly about emotional balance. And, um, and I was wondering what your thoughts were on addressing um, how to maintain emotional boundaries. Mm. Well, that's a big topic. I didn't want to bore some of the people who have heard me speak so much like Ed Holland and others because they've heard my helper's pit metaphor so many times and you have too. But, you know, I think it's, it is about, uh, I, think, I think mindfulness really comes into play. It's a useful way of thinking about things. How can we get a, have a perspective on our experience without diving into it, you know, so we can, be in touch with ourselves, but also not going into a self-focus and personal distress. That's the key, because personal distress derails empathy. So how do you do that? Well, what, what is it that keeps you in balance? And I think like I gave Carl's definition of empathy is sensing as the other person's experience as if it were your own without losing the as if quality. People have written about constructive zone where we're actually with that pain with the other, and, and it isn't going to traumatize us. We're feeling it's a healing moment. And that's certainly where I go with my clients who are sometimes very distressed, very much in pain. And when I'm there, um, I've, I've really developed an ability and it's not detached concern, I hate that term. It's really being there with them in that place where there's the greatest pain and, and to sense the healing that can happen there. And that as the, you're holding that, that pain with them, they begin to get a mastery of it. And it doesn't mean overcoming it. It means that they're able to be with it. So then ultimately the task is to be able to touch that place inside and for it not to be, not to immediately bump into the pain, but to be able to then access the positive memories and, and to have that presence of the loved one. You know, I'm, I'm speaking about grief counseling now. But I think in general that's true. It's when 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 it's 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 to provide that, and that's the you know classic psychotherapy kind of model, is that the client can then master these traumas and these difficult experiences when you're there providing a holding environment that that allows them to contact it. And you know I know you've been in hundreds and hundreds of situations. You know think about though I think the thing I, the, the the chapter on 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 resilience. The point I make is that we all have to discover what works for us. <laughs> you know, you know what, what are the things that help us and keep us from falling down into the pit? Certainly, probably good supervision is not, not a bad thing. You know, your own health 
your own your own store of energy is important your communication skills that's why i tried to provide all these different skills in the book you need good communication skills you can be highly empathic but if you don't have them you have more stress this is there's research on this that i, I cite you know if you don't have the skills then you're going to have burnout so you need to have the time which very often the system doesn't provide we've got innate altruism but we need the time, we need the skills, we need the sense of weeness, right, in order to put that empathy to work and then to, to maintain balance. You know, there's there's a lot there to unpack with that, um, but I think it is the key challenge, isn't it? Because otherwise we avoid if we feel like I can't deal with this. And, um, and then we leave people alone. And I think it's a skill that we, I wouldn't call it a skill, it, it's a, more of an attitude um, that we develop in a stance. And I know that everyone in this room, you know, does that, you know, in our own way, you know, but it's, it takes courage. Diana Fosha said, the therapist has to be courageous and the client has to feel safe. And I think that's true in all our work, right? We have to be courageous. This is courageous work. I know it, it sounds self-serving, but I really think it's true. I think it is courageous. I'm scared in these situations, even after 40 years of doing therapy and being with people who are going through experiences I can't even describe that are so bad, <laughs> if, you know, with just just unbelievable torture, et cetera, you know, which challenge me. So we have to develop a philosophy of life also that we can live with when we see all this pain. By the way, you know, let's not forget that 99.9% .9 of the population is avoiding all these situations. You're, we're all here together trying to learn together, but the rest of the world is trying to avoid these, these experiences and these situations. And, and you know, you, you could get discouraged by that or you could be encouraged by it and think, you know, this is what we need to be there for each other. And, you know, the greatest gift you can give anybody is the death that they wish, I think, so. I don't know. I think somebody else said that a long time ago. Um, but um, it's what mission's all about, right, Susan? Um, yeah. Um, so who else? This is so exciting, I'll tell you. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. Yeah. Okay, Jeannie, good keep up the good work. You are thank you. Uh, you're one of my heroes. These That's Jeannie, Jeannie, Jeannie does people like her are the heroes that I write about. Words. Yes. And for those that don't know Jeannie, which may be a lot of people, but um, Jeannie is um, with the Chinese American Coalition for Compassionate Care that has taken so much of the educational information out there and has it translated and has it uh, culturally realigned so that it's appropriate for Chinese members of our community to receive end of life care that's aligned with their values, their cultural beliefs and their um, their hopes and dreams as well. So thank you so much for the work that you do. And we have loved the trainings that you have offered to our um, staff and volunteers. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so we're gonna come back for Les and for Susan, but there is a, there's a couple of questions that I just wanna get to here in the chat. And one of them is from Louise. She says, um, has the pandemic generated isolation increased our sense of being alone in a different world? And has this perhaps decreased our compassion? Um, boy, uh, the, the isolation is one of the things um, that I've focused a lot on. I actually have a little talk on that, that its impact on compassion. I'm not, I'm not sure. I think it limits, it limits us in terms of uh, connectedness, um, obviously, even though we can do a lot in Zoom. I think it's like if let's say um, you know like Ed Ed Holland's a friend of mine you know and another hero for me in the work from way back but like I don't feel like hey Ed let's zoom you know because you know it's it's sort of an imposition I mean I want to do that but if I'm needing to talk to someone sometimes it, everybody's zoomed out everybody's zoom fatigue so in other words. Let's say Ed said he had something going on, or Jeannie said she had something going on, or uses, you know, I, uh, I don't know, it, it'd just be easier if we were near each other or able to talk. I, I find that isolation inhibit limits it, but it's not, what I'm hoping is that we don't end up with what I call um, scared, situational coronavirus activated relational disorder, <laughs> S-C-A-R-E-D, 
because you know I'm finding myself afraid of people almost like when they're walking toward me. Uh, and how do you disinhibit that? How do you then stop being afraid of people? Can I hug like Connie? Connie over there. I'm looking at Connie on my screen. Let's say Connie and our friends and I see her. I want to hug her, right? I want to hug her, but now I'm going like, geez, I don't know. Can we hug now? You know, is it going to be? How long is it going to be like this? And I'm worried about the social implications of this. So is that is that compassion? I I feel very compassionate. I feel like I'm kind of yearning more than ever for you know uh, these kinds of connections and helping people. And frustrated sometimes that I can't. You know, my clients say, "When can we meet?" You know, individual. You know, in person. They want to be in person. They don't. They they put up with this yeah. tele teletherapy, but. You know, um, it's not it's not the same. It's not the same. I write about I talk a little bit prescient on that. I write in the introduction. I talk about with the advent of teletherapy, telemedicine. You know, <laughs> this is before COVID. I was right, and I have some studies in the book about you know the impact of the medical record. You know, uh, att attending to the medical record, not the patient, on on uh, patient care, but. Um, yeah, no, that's a great question. What's the long-term impact going to be? I'd like to know what every, this is where we could do a poll, Susan. What do you, you know, what, just saying, we could say, how many of us think it will be increased compassion or decreased compassion? I just am so frustrated with some of the dynamics in our, you know, the, the nation when we have this opportunity. I'm hoping that turns around now and we can kind of end the divisiveness, but, you know, and, and have more compassion. I, I just uh, saw the, you know, the genies with the Asian community, the attacks on Asian Americans. Sherry Wang in my department's doing a lot of good things in the media about that and is very concerned about that. She's an Asian, a new brilliant uh, faculty member in our department. <clears throat> and also we have Shauna Shapiro who does great work with mindfulness. So, and, and uh, you had David Feldman talking about hope. So my, my little department <laughs> at the university is, Kind of making its own little contribution to the polls. Yes. yes. Um, do you want me to do a poll? No, that's a, I, I think that we have to we'll skip uh, that. As a um, researcher, I have to think about the, exactly the question. But anyhow, that's true yeah. for us non. Um, we don't want to get discouraged. People, I'll just ask a question. Yeah, we might get unnecessarily discouraged. So we'll go to Les and then um, Les Morgan, could you unmute? And then we'll go back to, uh, there's a question from Eric here also in the chat and then we'll go to Susan. Let me say of Les, Les is one of the also pioneers in the field. I, you know, I, I'm not just saying this about these, I'm so honored that these, these, these people have come to this meeting. But anyhow, Les, I'll let you go, but you know I'm a fan of yours, so anyhow. No, I, I'm a pretender. Okay, me too. We're yeah, you, you're you're the one. Uh, just I did want to say that uh, I have always greatly admired your work, and I guess I have to go buy an, a second edition now. Um, my my question for you um, is about resilience, and that is a topic that you and I were talking about what twenty years ago, yeah. and the issue of how people respond, you can have different people respond to the same exogenous event in different ways due to endogenous forces within them. Mm -hmm. So I th the, the, the problem I'm interested in is how do we use this exogenous stress as an opportunity to teach resilience? Are there ways to talk to people about what's happening that helps increase their sense of endogenous control? There are so many people uh, that I in, am encountering, the, uh, forget the fact that somebody died, there's also other stuff going on. They, you know, they've lost the ability to go to the gym. Uh, mm -hmm. they may, they've lost their jobs. Mm -hmm. They don't know whether they can make the rent because there are simply no jobs available in their field anymore. Um, so the total exogenous stress level is way, way, way up at a level that's we've not previously seen in a generation mm -hmm. globally. Well, yeah, it, you know, the, the key point about resilience is that it's not, don't think of it as a fixed 
thing in a person. Think of it as an outcome. Resilience is an outcome. You either have a resilient outcome, coping with adversity. What is the outcome? That's how we, that is what resilience is. So we are all facing different stressors in our lives. So you're asking, well, how can we, how can we learn from these situations? What I encourage is, you know, here, here's a whole set of things we know from research are predictive or tend to be associated with positive outcomes. Ex the standard things, you know, support, exercise, positive appraisals, mindfulness, self-compassion, you know, these things really do make a difference. And then have the person kind of see, well, what's working for me? And also to understand the exogenous, in your terms, uh, stressors that are upon us. I mean, this is the key thing with burnout. People tend to blame themselves and also administrators tend to blame their staff like she's a burnout prone person, like she's burning out instead of recognizing that it's the environment that's causing this. And that's Chris Maslach's central point. Burnout doesn't reside in the person. It's, in the, it's not a bad apple, it's the keg that the apple's in. Right. And I think that pointing that out is really important. So we have to, in this COVID time, we gotta realize we are, we can all, we're all kind of, look, we're all here, we're being resilient. You showed up for this you know, session, we're hanging in there with this funny medium that we're working with. <clears throat> and that's very positive. But we have to acknowledge we have stress as a result of this. We're, how many of us have gotten all our vaccines? Are, are we going to deal with the variant? How are our kids doing in school? There's so many stressors. And we're getting into a big debate about uh, you know, COVID-related uh, grief. And is, should we even be labeling it that way, et cetera? You know, uh, is it, or is it these situational factors that are all really there for all of us? So, everyone's feeling some pain from isolation itself is shown to have tremendously powerful effects on our health, psychological and physical health. Absolutely. So we have to overcome isolation somehow, despite these limitations that we have in terms of physical presence. Um, Les, I'm not sure I'm answering it, but I'm saying, you know, to, to, to give people a more of an interactional understanding of stress, and that you know their appraisals make a big difference in how they're they're looking at the situation, but also they have to understand, hey, these are these are stressors that are affecting you, and it's not you know you that's the problem in this. Um, we have to, of course, take responsibility to change what we can change. Um, so I, I try to. I had a great quote on that. I think. Um, uh, well, anyhow. Um, yeah, but Les, did that touch on it a little bit, you know? Yes. I mean, I think you're acknowledging that sometimes it, when everything's out of control, it's okay to say that. Yes. And start by an acknowledgement of the reality that we're really in a bad situation here, folks. Yeah. I mean, I ask my students every class, I, I have them, well, how are you dealing with the COVID? you know, stressors that are happening. And, and I say, not very well at all, not well, well, very well. No one has said very well yet. <laughs> right. And then I think the other, the other question that I still am trying to get more techniques for is, given that the situation is terrible, how can you give somebody a mental strategy for thinking about how they're handling it that makes them feel more competent? Yeah, 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 that's, that's really great. You know, if we had more time, we could, if we had, this was became a uh, COVID support group for helping professionals. <laughs> you know, we, you'd be amazed the ideas that we would come up with and that we would go, you know, I could do that or I could do that. You know, we all have, are finding our own way through this. And I think it's a lot like our grieving clients and patients, you know, and families to find your way through those losses. You know, we know it takes a lot of reconfiguring. It takes a lot of meaning making, you know, it takes a lot of, and, and so we're on this, this kind of uh, grief journey and there's, you know, collectively and individually, I think. But yeah, it, it is, that, that's the challenge is how to, um, 
how to strengthen our, we can enhance our resilience. So you can do it. That's what, you know, your, your one hour uh, every other day walk in nature may not seem like much, but you know, actually there's some research on that can make a big difference, you know. So, but that may not be right for you. Um, but yeah, Les, anyhow, good, good thinking. Yes, thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, what else? This is, so I'm going to go to Susan Weisberg, and then there's a bunch of questions oh, in the chat, but Susan's I, been so patient. So I'm going to another, uh, another I, I just want to say you're the pioneer, Dale. Oh, and wow. my, I, have to, I can't wait to buy your second edition because my first edition is put together with librarian's tape and scotch tape and chewing gum and so forth. And, so, and I've stolen your wonderful helper's pit metaphor so many times. But okay. you did say something I wanted to ask you about. Um, Caregiver distress is alive and well with my client load, but you did say that it was changing. Did I mishear you? Was I imagining that? Can you say more about that? That Bill Haley and I did an article a while ago um, on end of life uh, psychologist and end of life care, and then in the book I have um, a, this a recent study that they did where they looked at caregiver. You're talking about family caregivers. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I think. You know, he wasn't exclusively looking at hospice. So I think we, you know, we got different domains here. I think hospice caregiving, and I think there are a lot of people in the room that could really add a lot to this discussion, is extremely stressful. And I think we've understated that. I think hospice has understated that to families and, you know, to, to not really let them, to really recognize that it is, can be extraordinarily stressful. There is no easy way, you know, to be full-time caregiver. This, there's a tremendous burden part to it, burden, burdensome part that we've, we've understated. I do think there's, and I think that's an issue in hospice. That's just my view on that. But I think that, um, uh, and I think we need to provide more support. We need to get more support to families than even we do now. Although I have certainly, you know, rescued just by getting people into hospice who are struggling. And, and once they get that kind of support, they're just so grateful. You know, we always know that people say, why did the only problem they have with hospice, why didn't it start sooner? You know, is what people say. Mm -hmm. But um, I think uh, it's real. We have to get more support to the people. But what we're talking about is just, you know, there how many tens of millions of caregivers are there caring for elderly parents or um, disabled family members, people who are struggling. Those folks are doing better than we thought. That's what this major finding is, if that makes any sense, because they're finding so much meaning in it. And they're, they're finding, um, you know, purpose. And, and I think they're realizing like, this is, this is what I'm doing for them. And, and hopeful that the next generation will be doing that for them as well. Thank you for the clarification. It really does matter which group is being sampled. Thank yeah, you for that. Totally. Yeah, thank you. yeah, I think like in hospice, we could have, we, we could, we'd have to study them separately. And then we have advanced Alzheimer's and we have, but there's so many caregiving situations, you know, and, uh, and I really, I, I think there's some good work going on, but gosh, I wish nationally we had you know, the caregiver project, you know, I'm sure that there might be things going on that I'm not aware of, but I would like to get more support because this is what's happening, you know, and hey, our generation, I don't know how many of you are in, you know, baby boomers or, you know, anyhow, my, at 72, it's not long before, uh, you know, our group, the 80 million of us are going to be, um, you know, as, as uh, we used to joke, you know, we're going to want everything uh, possible, like a latte, you know, when we want it and everything else. But um, we're, it's, we're, we're going to be there and we, we're going to want care and who's going to be there for us? That's going to be a big question, isn't it? Um, so I think a lot of us are, you know, as a nation, we have to really, really prepare for that. Um, and that's why we did the Finding Our Way newspaper series to, to try to empower um, Americans, you know, with these 80 million folks and say, hey, here's, here's better ways of dealing with this. So here's some good role models, people who are dealing with their parents in a nursing home or dealing with the death of a child or dealing with palliative care or dealing with grief, uh, you know, grief. So we had all these national experts, Ira Bayak and 
Marsha Lacondi link and, and the, all kinds of wonderful people uh, writing articles. And that's available. If you, uh, Susan's gonna send you the um, handout I had, which just had different links for some things I've been doing with webinars and that, not making money with any of this. So it's not a money-making thing, but um, um, you can go to my website, dalelarsonphd.com, and then in the, the resources, the, the Finding Our Way series is accessible there. And you can still use the articles. They're free to be used, however, and they're still, I think, pretty timeless because they're stories of grief and loss. Some of the resources are not around anymore, you know, the links and everything, but um, you can use them in your newsletters and things like that. Um, so. I just, my, my subtitle in my first book was, you know, Models for Giving Psychology Away. I'm a big, I really believe that's what all psychology should be about is, you know, trying to see what's useful to people and share it with them and not to be marketing it and trying to, um, you know, try, let's try to get it out there to people if it's really useful and meaningful. Um, yeah, maybe we have time for one more. Do we have time for one more? Are we? Well, we have, um, I've been trying, let's see if I just, so Eric's question is coming up here. I lost him in this scroll here, I think. I appreciate Eric, that. are you still here? I am, oh, yes. Why don't you just unmute yourself? I will try to scroll through and find you if you're okay with me highlighting. Sure. And then go ahead and feel free to ask your question. Sure. Um, hi, I'm, um, I'm a chaplain and I do work with chaplain education. Um, and I was fascinated by your comment about self-concealment. Um, mm. And so I was wondering um, if there are some themes of self-concealment, you know, what we hide from self and others that you have found common or helpful to address in a therapeutic or caring, helping relationship, particularly if it relates, uh, particularly as it relates to grief loss or um, bereavement? Yeah, that's so many themes, you know, um, in the in the helper secrets realm, one that I didn't read was uh, one spiritual care person wrote, and this will, this may shock you a little bit, but we'll see. I work in spiritual care on a palliative care ward. People think, assume I believe in God in an afterlife. I'm at the point I don't really believe in God or the afterlife. I feel a fraud. Now, you have to step back from that. And with all the helper secrets, you have to step back and go, the first response might be maybe some judgment, like, whoa, how could you say that? You're a spiritual care person. But you see the painful aspect to that. What people have, for example, um, you know, distance themselves from patients and families, and then they feel terrible about that. They're caring people, and they, they don't want to have distance themselves, so they conceal that. Certainly, uh, you know, there's so many uh, examples um, in the book um, and, you know, in my experience of the ways that secrets, um, you know, play such a big role in secret keeping in our work and in psychotherapy. There's a great vignette in the book. It was too long for me to read, but this, this one social worker, I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but uh, Kia Altieri in Minnesota, I was doing a program there and she was a, a, a social worker who just began working with patients and she described working with a Korean vet, um, a military Korea, uh, the war in Korea who was dying. And he went on crying saying, it was just such a waste, such a waste. And she, she's holding his hand, but she was Korean. And when she first walked in the room, he said, are you Korean? And you know, usually, I don't know, Jeannie, maybe you could, if Jeannie's still here, I mean, people don't immediately recognize when someone's Korean. They might go through all the Asian different, you know, groups and not not get Korean right away, right? So she was like stunned, like, "Whoa, yes, I am." It's, do you want me to? Uh, you want to get somebody else? You know, she thought it just pushed a button. He said, "No, no, no, stay." So she didn't know what she was in for, and he went on to describe the war and you know the survivor guilt and all that and the terrible feeling. So he dies. And, and it's, the, it's her first hospice experience. This may be a good way to final question to end with, because I know I really appreciate, appreciate your patience staying with us this long. And, and she goes and he's died and she's very moved. She goes over and kisses him on the forehead and, you know, and then, 
Ethel later comes back into the room and the two sons are there. And she says, yeah, your father was so powerful and so wonderful to be with him. And he shared about the war and his experiences. They said, what war? Uh, and she said, what do you mean? We didn't know he was in the war. We never knew, never knew about that. He had lived with them all these years and had never shared his experiences, which were the experiences on his deathbed that he could confess to a Korean social worker because he was telling her how badly he felt about this whole thing. And he had never shared it with anybody else. So, you know, these are the end of life conversations that happen. And these are very, very special, you know, and that's where spiritual care, you, I'm sure, you know, you have those kind of experiences, um, especially in spiritual care. You know, you're so important um, being with patients when they're really struggling with the big questions, the ultimate questions. And, um, and then, you know, the unfinished business in one's life. And that very often is, uh, you know, brings thoughts of God and, uh, and the spiritual realm we were talking about earlier. So I think, you know, Eric, I think I'm glad you're there. I'm glad you're all there doing the work you're doing. And I really mean that from the bottom of my heart. So I want to thank you all because you bring a lot of light when it's dark and a lot of warmth when it's cold. And, you know, that's what it's all about. So I really appreciate you spending the time with me. I don't want to keep you later because I'm trying to help you manage stress. And that wouldn't be a good idea. But I really, really appreciate any of you want to be in touch. You can always email me. And, and, uh, and Susan, I want to thank you for uh, your great work and for uh, hosting this tonight. So thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Dale. And for everybody that's still with us, thank you for staying, particularly those on the East Coast where it's getting up to midnight. And I wanted to let you know that uh, Dale's going to be back with us in June to do a talk. This is sort of a, a book. Remember that, Dale? Yeah, I'll send you that date. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to just mention, um, I don't know if you've, if you and Jessica Zitter ever talk, but I'm going to introduce you to, if you don't know each other, cause she's got a new film called caregiver, a love story. And she's putting together a training and some companion pieces too, that we're going to show it in June. So, um, my thought was to have the film and then your talk about caregiving, um, and being a carer and um so we'll show her film one night and then your talk so wow. it's all gonna be packaged together lovely but i'll introduce the two of you because i think you'd have a lot to talk with each other about in this realm um, for all of you i want to thank you so very much if you live in our service area which is san mateo county and santa clara county in california please know that you can contact us at any time um, our phone number is fairly widely available if you are navigating a acute illness, uh, chronic illness, uh, and you are concerned for a family member who might be nearing end of life. And um, we are the people to come to. We also have a beautiful hospice house in Redwood City where your family can be with you. And this was a great benefit to many families during the, the last year where they could be with their loved one when they were dying at the hospice house instead of having somebody die. Hospital. So we're extraordinarily grateful for that. Um, I'll be sending an email out to you all with the resources that Dale talked about in just a few minutes. And um, there are just a few questions still here, Dale. I don't know if you have time to do this since we want to lower your stress well, too. I'm fine. I just don't want to stress people. Feel free to leave now and thank you for coming. Okay. Don't hesitate. Uh, but if we have a couple more, we could stick around. That's fine. Okay, so I'm going to stop the official recording now, and I just want to thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to having you back with us in uh, June, Dale. Thank you so much, and for Mission Hospice and from our Community Education Department, we're so grateful to you all for being here.